Good evening and welcome to the Archaeology Cafe. I'm pleased to be your host tonight. Um, for those who don't know me and haven't met me yet, my name is Sarah Anderson and I have the honor of serving as the Director of Outreach here at Archaeology Southwest. Um, as many of you know, uh, this event has been hosted by our president, Bill Dooley, for the past 15 years. So I have some big shoes to fill tonight. I'm excited to embark on this journey with all of you. So um, without further ado, I welcome to you to the 2023-2024 season of the Archaeology Cafe. Um, this program, and especially this season, season, could be easily called the Preservation Archaeology Cafe. Preservation archaeology is at the heart of what Archaeology Southwest's mission and practice. Uh, but what exactly does it mean? In our view, it is a holistic and conservation-based approach to exploring and protecting heritage places while honoring their diverse values. Our vision, the change we want to see in the world, is that heritage places, and ancestral landscapes, and associated knowledge and values are stewarded, protected, and respected and celebrated across the U.S. and the world. How are we making that happen? Well, we compile archaeological information, make it accessible and understandable, and share it with the public and decision makers. We advocate for landscape scale protection and steward heritage properties and conservation easements. We are committed to real and ongoing collaboration with indigenous communities. This year, our cafe, our archaeology cafe theme, is entitled Nourishing Body, Soul, and Earth traditional foods and foodways. It's a fascinating exploration of how food has shaped and continues to shape our cultural, our cultures and societies. But before we get into tonight's program, let's take a moment to acknowledge the land on which we gather. We recognize that Archaeology Cafe is on the homelands of the Tohono O'odham Nation and the lands of the Pascuyaki tribe. And we encourage that all of you take a moment to reflect on whose lands you are on tonight. So without um, further ado, I'd like to welcome our first presenter, Dr. Nicole Mathwick. She is an assistant professor of, our, of anthropology at San Diego State University. Her, pre her presentation tonight is entitled Tame or Wild, Emergent Ranching Communities of the Spanish Colonial uh, Pimera Alta. Um, and she is with us tonight right here. So I uh, thank you for being here and we hope uh, you are as excited as we are to explore the rich world of traditional foods and foodways. Um, so here we go. Uh, thank you uh, for that introduction, Sarah. Um, I'm very excited to be presenting uh, for ARC Southwest. Um, and I wanted to also do a brief uh, acknowledgement, um, because I am on uh, land uh, borrowed and occupied by the Kumeyaay, and uh, just want to express the following and encourage you all to kind of look at further, and I'm hoping this presentation also will give you some food for thought and reflection. But speaking of food, uh, one of the things I study, I am a historical archaeologist here in the borderlands of the U.S. and Mexico, and I study ecologies of colonialism. Um, I'm at San Diego State as an assistant professor, and I am very interested in the human responses to environmental, social, and political change as it relates to European expansion. Uh, specifically, I look at the historical ecology of Native Americans and Euro-Americans in the past few hundred years, and how the pressures of colonialism uh, have resulted in adaptation, uh, new, cultural adaptations uh, and changes to the environment and to people's life ways as a result of contact. Uh, I explore these themes with zooarchaeology, stable isotopes, computer modeling, and historical documents, uh, a few of which will feature in today's presentation. But because I get to kick off uh, the series on food and food traditions, I wanted to begin uh, with Sonoran food traditions, uh, something that I hope many of you may recognize uh, BK's carne asada, or maybe you've had a chance to sample it, or uh, one of the other uh, many uh, wonderful places in Tucson and environs, uh, or even in Sonora. Uh, but this cold kind of broader region of Sonoran food traditions has its origins in the Spanish colonial period and 
I wanted to talk about that and to talk about kind of the cow part of the equation when it comes to the origins of uh, many of the foods we consider uh, the food traditions of this region. Um, there are many Sonoran foods uh, with colonial and native origins, so things that are kind of emerging in the Spanish colonial period, things like flour tortillas, burros, uh, carne asada, chili colorado, carne seca, membrillo, coyotas, just like wonderful things. I hope you all have had a chance to try them, and if you haven't, please uh, add it to your list. Uh, but you'll notice that beef is featuring very heavily into some of the major traditions, um, and it's a very important food item uh, throughout uh, the northern Mexican borderlands. And carne asada, carne seca are something that's very specific uh, and special to Sonora. Not carne asada in general, but um, it's quite special here. Uh, and the origins of the kind of beef is coming from cattle and cattle are not native to Sonora. They were introduced during the colonial period along with other livestock such as cows, pigs, sheep, and horses. Uh, and this was all part of this huge biological and social uh, exchange of diseases and people and species of plants and animals uh, between uh, Europe, Asia, and Africa and the Americas that was a result of contact. And it's a lot of what was happening kind of on the ground in different areas is really driven by colonial pressures. And so in this presentation, I will be defining colonialism as the policy or practice of acquiring full or partial political control over another country, occupying it with settlers and exploiting it economically. And the exploitation is an important part of this uh, definition because it's really an extractive process. And we'll get into that a little bit more. Uh, it, animals are a really significant part of this because they have the ability to drastically alter the landscape uh, and to also take advantage of parts of the landscape that humans traditionally didn't eat as much of, such as grasses. Uh, so they can turn that into hide, uh, fat, uh, wool, milk, and meat. So there's a lot of uh, new ways to extract things from the environment when you introduce livestock. But that gets into an interesting question anthropologically. So to pull back a little bit, what makes a domesticated animal anyway? Uh, all of these animals, these livestock, we consider them domesticated, but what does that actually mean? And in archaeology on a global level, zooarchaeologists like myself have been studying what makes a domesticated animal for decades. Uh, and we have a variety of definitions, such as wild is, is an animal that has very little contact with humans and is uh, going to be undergoing natural selection uh, in terms of its breeding. It's not being controlled by humans really in any way. And that's in contrast to uh, a tame animal, which isn't domesticated, but uh, might be friendly towards humans, may have been raised by birth by humans. Uh, compared to domesticated, which we see genetic and morphological changes and as a result of long-term contact and humans inserting themselves into kind of breeding and rearing of these animals. So it really becomes, uh, an animal is taken out of natural selection and human selection becomes more important for that animal's uh, evolution. And humans, and animals have a very complex relationship. And in some ways they are also domesticating us. <laughs> uh, but zooarchaeologists and archeologists around the world have studied this using genetics, you swear on bones and teeth, animal population structures, osteometrics, uh, which is like bone measurements, uh, stable isotopes, artifacts, and ethnographic evidence to, in order to identify when domestication is happening, how long it's taking and where animals are in the spectrum of wild versus domesticated. But there are these interesting gray areas uh, or you know, when good animals go bad, uh, but really it's, it's when animals go feral. We see domesticated animals go feral quite frequently. Uh, good example here is uh, the domesticated pig. We've seen pigs and feral hogs take over many areas uh, and impact farming across the Southern part of the US uh, and uh, they've been historically important feral uh, pigs for hunting in the Caribbean and other areas um, of the world. 
So when animals go feral, they do genetically look the same as domesticated. They look the same osteologically as domesticated, but they are behaviorally quite different. Um, and so there is a need in archaeology, I feel, for a term like semi-feral, sort of a domesticated species that is not encountering humans very often, but is still subject to significant human exploitation, that people are pretty reliant on this resource, even though these animals are not being controlled by humans in a really significant way. Um, so there's this kind of gray area. So I won't particularly in the Southwest, uh, it's important to kind of help define that. So I want to introduce this idea of semi-feral ranching, and it's gonna actually sound quite familiar to many of you, but it's this type of ranching uh, that is where kind of open range ranching is another term for it, but it's when animals are allowed to wander, to procreate without human interference. Uh, it's unfenced. Uh, they're not kind of limited in any significant way. They have limited contact with humans, maybe a few uh, times a year, if less. Um, and this was an extremely, extremely common uh, ranching practice throughout Western North America during the historical period and into South America, too. And so you're probably wondering, okay, why why should we even bother distinguishing semi-feral ranching? Like everyone knows about open ranges. This is like a historical thing, right? Uh, true, but it's always assumed in the historical rec record, but it's not necessarily proven. And so we can't assume all species are being treated like this uh, in the Spanish mission uh, period or uh, after. And it's important to have these terms and to define them so that we can have criteria for global comparisons, so that we can look at what's happening uh, in Sonora and Southern Arizona, and we can compare it to say, what's happening with uh, feral cattle on the Pampas with the gauchos. There are similarities, but if we don't have definitions uh, to compare them by, it's hard to make these broader uh, comparisons. And also semi-feral ranching is, in some ways falling out of favor uh, for its historical forms. There are some kind of mixed ways of doing it uh, where animals are still out on the range, but they don't have the same sort of uh, freedoms that they had before. Um, and with the rising population in the US West, uh, it's just not tenable anymore to have these animals roaming all over the place. Uh, so fencing and uh, finishing on feedlots has been a major part in uh, some of the shifts we've seen in ranching in recent decades. Uh, so the question is then how do we go about identifying semi-feral situations archaeologically? Okay, so we can see this happening uh, in the historical period potentially, but then what would we look at in terms of the material culture? Uh, let's take a look at some behaviors that we would expect to see associated with uh, these practices. Uh, first, we would likely see minimal foddering. Uh, we would, there, people are not going out and throwing bales of hay uh, for these animals. The animals are going out and having to forage for themselves. Um, so the, the correlate of that is that the water and diet will reflect local conditions. Uh, these animals are going to have infrequent contact with humans. Uh, their breeding and birthing is occurring away from humans. Um, so they're uh, population structure will likely be more akin to kind of natural populations, uh, potentially. Uh, and so the result, though, is that their age is not really tracked closely. And so adults might be older than what would be optimal for like a pure meat strategy, which would be uh, culling the animals when they're about maybe between two and four years old. Uh, and they reach their full weight uh, between three and four years. Uh, this particularly cattle, not necessarily sheep. So archeologically, what we might be looking for is that uh, we can see isotopic differences in diet uh, compared to animals that are more closely uh, watched, more closely monitored. Uh, we'll see a lack of detailed historical records of sex, age, and counts. So when people do bother to count them, it's not gonna be that detailed because no one's really spending a huge amount of time with these animals. Um, and there's also older individuals uh, based on bone fusion and tooth eruption. So we can actually look at the skeletons and be like, oh, okay, these animals are a little older than what we would expect. 
Uh, so let's take a look at this case study. Uh, this case study is uh, at, from Mission Guavavi. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with the area, Mission Guavavi is located about six miles uh, north of the U.S.-Mexico border. And it's today administered by the National Park Service. They have tours if you ever would like to visit. It's a very pretty site. And it's right along uh, the Santa Cruz River. Uh, it was occupied uh, between the 1690s and 1820s, but the mission itself ended and it was abandoned in 1775. And the remaining people in the community ended up moving northwards towards Tumacabri. Uh, the area is a riparian desert environment. Uh, but it's quite dry in the hills uh, surrounding, but most of the agriculture and where people were farming was in the river valley. Uh, Guavavi is sort of at the tip and fringe of Northern New Spain. Uh, and it is uh, the traditional homelands of the Tahana Atam and Sabaipuri Atam. Um, and all of these groups are impacted by colonialism. But what is interesting about this region of the Pima Rialta compared to other areas of Sonora is that really only about half of the Adam speaking groups in the region were directly colonized uh, by the missions. And so there's a lot of areas that weren't. And so people had the opportunity to go back and forth um, and visit relatives. And so it's a really kind of interesting moment uh, for looking at comparisons um, and looking at how people are responding to colonial intrusions into their homes, home territories. During this time period, people are practicing a sedentary agriculture with seasonal mobility. So they're moving around, but they're also farming. And as livestock become incorporated into these patterns, uh, these patterns and life ways are continuing to produce uh, an agro-pastoral life way. Um, so what, another way of thinking about this uh, and what's happening in the Pima Rialta is thinking of this in terms of waves of colonial intrusions. Um, and so this is taken from Tom Sheridan's 1992 uh, work, but it's the idea that there's several kind of waves of colonial intrusion that each have sort of different goals. Uh, and the first one is actually agrarian. A lot of people think of invasion and they think of intrusion and colonialism and they think it's very militaristic, but it's very interesting in the Prima Rialta because the first wave is actually agricultural and it's with the missions. And the mission's goals were to basically turn uh, these uh, Tana Atam villages into something resembling Spanish peasants. Um, they did not succeed. And I think that's also an important point. Uh, but this first wave was agrarian and it produced uh, the surpluses and the herd sizes that were needed to later support uh, mining and mining activities and then later sort of military establishments uh, that came a little bit after. Uh, but all those ended up supporting this overall colonial uh, establishment and intrusion. And when we talk about this period, I'm sure for those of you living in Arizona, you have heard of Father Kino. And I'm not gonna be focusing on him today because this is something that uh, we see happen um, kind of across the borderlands that the Euro-American missionaries tend to get heroized uh, in popular histories, not necessarily in academic histories anymore, but in popular histories. And so we see Junipero Serra get canonized in California. We see these like these big statues of Father Kino uh, nobly leading cattle into Arizona. Uh, and it's part of uh, popular histories in Arizona. Um, and that's not something that really reflects what was actually going on at the missions because most of the work, most of the day-to-day -day life uh, was being lived and practiced by indigenous peoples. Uh, so I frame my work within uh, post-colonial theory, which is a critical literary theory, uh, which tries to address and remedy Eurocentric histories of colonial areas and colonized areas, uh, specifically the kind of the exclusion of indigenous experiences and perspectives. Um, so what does this mean when I look at my research and I'm looking at Spanish mission sites? It means that I'm, I'm trying to actively reframe and refocus around indigenous experiences. And if I can't get at those in the, the historical record, looking at 
the labor and offering a kind of a more balanced approach toward what was actually happening based on the ratio of, of Euro-Americans to indigenous peoples in a particular place. Uh, so it's trying to sort of rebalance, uh, rebalance what's been told. Uh, so the methods I'll be using uh, to explore this particular case study are going to be centered around uh, the Feature 26 Mission Midden, uh, which were two units that were excavated in 2013 as part of the Mission Guavavi Field School. Uh, and it produced over 40,000 pieces of animal bone, of which I will be kind of presenting a very, very small portion of. Um, and I'll be using methods like animal bone identification uh, or zoogeology. I'll also be using stable isotopic assays to evaluate diet. And I will be using historical texts to help contextualize and explore this kind of idea of how closely were these animals tracked. So the research questions that I'll try to address in this talk are, can we see semi-feral animal husbandry at Mission Guavi archeologically using the criteria that I set out earlier? And how does this historical semi-feral management potentially fit, if it's there, into modern ranching today? How do we sort of make sense of this historical uh, approach towards ranching with what is happening with ranching today? Because ranching is still extremely economically important, both in Arizona and Sonora. It hasn't gone away. So the first uh, piece of information that I would like to present to you is going to be taken from uh, it's based on a principle of animal bone fusion. Uh, so with animals, uh, particularly mammals, uh, their mammals have terminal growth, meaning that once they reach adulthood, they don't necessarily grow anymore, which is different from for, compared to other species. Uh, and there's a point at which uh, the long bones in particular will stop growing and there, this cartilaginous plate in between the shaft of the bone and the end of the bone will fuse and the two kind of come together. And what's interesting is that that occurs on a regular schedule for most mammals and we know that schedule. And so we can use that information to identify uh, particular ages and age ranges for animals in the past. Uh, so zooarchaeology is the study of animal bones from archaeological sites. Uh, so this is a bunch of, this is what I was looking at uh, for this, this work. It's a bunch of busted up animal bone. Um, it's all animal bone. And this is just, you know, maybe one thirtieth of what I was looking at. So that was great. It's good stuff. Good stuff. Uh, you can see a little uh, cow uh, toe right here. Um, but this is what we found at Mission Guavavi. And so one of the results of my analysis was that looking at the fused and unfused bone is that cattle in particular had much older fused bone elements, particularly late fusing bones. And caprines on the other hand, uh, so caprines here are referring to cattle, uh, to, uh, sorry, sheep and goats, because uh, as you can tell, some of the bone was so busted up, I couldn't actually tell if it was, sheep or goat. And so I use the more conservative uh, taxonomic category of caprine. Uh, based on what we know from the emissions uh, and the ratios of sheep to goat, it's most likely sheep, but we still kind of keep the possibility open that there might be some goat. Um, so the caprines on the whole were more juvenile and uh, the cattle have more fused elements indicating more mature adults. Okay. Uh, I also looked at uh, teeth and teeth emergence. Um, so uh, teeth will emerge at different ages uh, on a regular schedule, very similar to the bone fusion. Um, and so when teeth are emerging, the cattle are also showing that they're older. Uh, there's They tend to be older than 36 months. So basically their third molars are have emerged and show in wear. So I can't really tell past 36 months, but it's likely that they're older because they do show significant in wear on that third molar. Uh, caprines on the other hand trended younger. Uh, they were 12 to 24 months and they had a meat focused culling strategy for, it appears that there was kind of a meat focused culling strategy for cattle. So they are targeting that older full weight uh, animal, which is what we would expect to see if you're trying to get the most 
out of the animal for meat and uh, tallow purposes. So as I, okay, so cool, but this, none of this is diagnostic of semi-feral management. And I, this is, this is a kind of giving me a trend with like each piece of information is, okay, it's interesting, but like how it, in and of itself, it's not diagnostic. Um, so let's take a look at the isotopes. Um, so this uh, isotopic work was uh, drilled and sampled from tooth enamel from the cattle and calf brain teeth at the site for a total of 13, uh, which is actually the largest sample I've ever had in Spanish colonial period. Most sites don't have nearly this many teeth. So this was a very special site. <laughs> uh, what we found here is that cattle uh, were drinking from different water sources and eating more grass. Uh, and particularly C4 grasses, which are uh, generally found in the semi-desert grasslands uh, in the region. Um, so they are kind of eating and drinking and from a different part of the landscape than the caprines, who are um, these little black dots here. Uh, and so you can see both in terms of oxygen and uh, carbon-13, they are different. So let's take a look at the historical information. Um, so I compared uh, three different entregas. So entregas are reports uh, of kind of what the mission uh, kind of inventories uh, of what's happening at the mission. I'm pre I present one here now, but for simplicity's sake, uh, there were three and they all displayed some similar information. Uh, but what we have here is that the uh, count of cattle were 815. Uh, in terms of sheep, there were more sheep, actually, than, than cattle at the time. And that's another interesting thing to think about. People don't always realize that there were actually quite a few of sheep at most of these missions. They often think of cattle. Um, but you can see that there's quite close monitoring of the ages of the lambs, uh, of the ewes, and uh and the sexes of the, the different animals, as well as mules. Mules, <laughs> they were keeping track of the mules uh, and the ages of the mules, as well as the oxen, which were the castrated cattle. Uh, but you don't see that level of detail in the cattle count, and that's true uh, for every entrega that I looked at. Uh, so putting this all together, alone, Need, none of these kind of lines of evidence are diagnostic of semi-feral management, but together they do show distinct management strategies between the sheep, uh, caprines, and uh, cattle. So you do see a greater control of sheep age, uh, and cattle are, are past optimal age when they are being killed and butchered. And they tend to be older, they tend to be full weight, so they're being targeted uh, as adult individuals. Um, and cattle are consuming more C4 grasses, which we would expect to see in semi-desert grasslands and not necessarily in riparian river valleys. Um, and this makes sense uh, in, when you kind of think that there are no fences in this period and you don't really want your cows to be eating your crops, which would have been a major problem for Tahana Atam farmers um, to have these kind of animals wandering into their fields. Uh, so you do want to keep these animals kind of away from uh, perhaps the river valleys, but these animals are also obligate drinkers and still require quite a bit of water. Uh, so what we're seeing here and what we have evidence of is evidence for dual strategies. Uh, cattle were likely semi-feral uh, based on kind of these different lines of information. Sheep, however, were not. And it's kind of when we see these two together that we see the, kind of these differences in management styles. Uh, and part of that is sort of based on the species. Uh, Criollo cattle breeds are relatively independent um, compared to sort of the modern preferred cattle breeds that we see today, such as Angus, which is a British breed, which is much more uh, stockier. They don't climb hills as well, which is really a tough thing in Sonora. Uh, they require more water, but they have a lot more fat, and so they're more commercially viable. But in the past, uh, the Criollo cattle, they were smaller, they were rangier, uh, and uh, they could protect themselves from different uh, predators. Sheep, on the other hand, would be more vulnerable to uh, mountain lions, to coyotes, uh, to uh, jaguars, and required a little bit more, a uh, little bit more maintenance. 
uh, especially in terms of, of shearing. Uh, so sheep just require more monitoring. So some of this is kind of the natural needs of the uh, animal uh, and the natural sort of tendencies. So it's not necessarily predictable. Um, so how does Guavavi fit into broader regional trends in the Pima Rialta? Uh, so in terms of indigenous populations and livestock herds, what we see sort of in the period uh, Guavavi was occupied between 1690 and 1775 is we see uh, a lot of uh, Tana Atam coming into the mission and then also a precipitous sort of drop um, around the 1767, which is partially due to the Jesuit expulsion. So it's not necessarily um, entirely disease, but disease was uh, severely impacting uh, a lot of the people living um, in, in the region. And eventually the, the population stabilized, but it continued a downward trend for quite a long time um, at the mission sites. So I so this is we only really have the demographic information for the mission sites. Uh, and that's, as I mentioned before, this is not the whole region. Uh, but one thing that is notable is the, the huge increase in livestock uh, population throughout the mission period. Uh, and this kind of semi-feral strategy, uh, as well as kind of this active management of sheep, was incredibly successful at creating really large herds. Uh, once uh, the uh, Spanish lost control of the region, uh, and we see this increase in raiding, we do see a precipitous drop in cattle populations and sheep populations in in the region. So. I want to kind of reiterate who is actually doing this animal management. Uh, for the most part, this is being done primarily by Tahana Adam labor. And I want to raise the question, was this coerced or voluntary? And, and we can't tell from the archaeological remains. I think we have to assume that people are not always doing this because they want to, um, but they are kind of in a situation where at the mission where to continue living where they are, they have to uh, they have to participate in this type of labor. Uh, so I just want to focus instead on the fact that the labor is happening and it is it is native. Uh, but these locations and these the places where they're putting these cattle are away from mission ranches. They're they're away from the main sort of mission area, and there's potentially less oversight. Uh, and this is perhaps uh, one of the origins of Tahana Atam ranching, which still continues to this day. And I also want to note that uh, these ranchers are doing this all with surface water. This is a period of time before sort of deep uh, groundwater mining. And although people were, had dug wells, uh, most of these animals are being watered and these herds are growing primarily based on surface water and, and water storage. And the Tana Atam have a very, very long history. I'm sure you've uh, had this in your talks here at Archaeology Cafe about all the irrigation and water storage complexes that have been apparent uh, uh, prior to contact. But that tradition continued on, uh, especially with uh, ranching and the needs of these animals that was turned towards uh, keeping these animals alive in a, quite a dry desert region. So what are the long-term consequences of these patterns? What, what happened uh, as a result of this kind of long-term interaction uh, on the border. The Spanish carried lessons that they learned in the arid Pima Rialta to other regions of the Spanish borderlands, particularly where I live now in San Diego. Um, and the source herds and crops uh, from Sonora became the seed herds for secular settlers throughout Sonora and as well as Alta, Alta California. So the sort of desert adaptation and learning also traveled um, to new colonial regions. And there's also the integration of animal husbandry into Tahana Atam culture. So this wasn't something that was, you know, received or imposed necessarily, but was something that became integrated uh, through a long period of time um, into uh, Tahana Atam culture. And so when you go to San Javier Mission today, you might get a pop over, uh, the base of which is going to be Chile Colorado, which contains beef. Um, 
And while it's not considered perhaps a traditional food, uh, it's something that is still very culturally important both uh, to people in the region today, but also specifically to Adam speakers on both sides of the US-Mexico border. So the question I have for you is why does any of this matter? Why should you care? Uh, here we have this lovely photo of a bull rider at the Taha Atam All Indian Rodeo. There is an All Indian Rodeo circuit uh, in the US and it's because it is so culturally significant and important economically to uh, Indian communities and American Indian communities uh, throughout the US. But the reason I got interested, weirdly enough, into this topic is because of the media around Clive and Bundy. I don't agree with him politically, but I remember watching this, this uh, he's an Anglo-American rancher who has run afoul of the law and uh, different sorts of issues. And it has kind of become a symbol for very keep government out sorts of uh, approach to ranching, which is very prevalent in different parts of the US West. Uh, but what's interesting I found uh, about the coverage of his his life as a rancher is that they portray him as a bad rancher and they call his ranching practices bizarre, his uh, way of dealing with his cattle neglectful, he, his cattle are terrorizing people because they are open range and they wander wherever they want. And he is continuing to illegally uh, graze his animals on federal lands without uh, permits. But what was interesting, I found interesting about this coverage was that he was basically doing semi-feral open range ranching. That, that's essentially what he's doing, which historically has been done throughout the US West, but the modern context has made that unacceptable. And so now people are portraying it as neglectful, the animals are dying in the desert. And actually that's what was happening uh, through most of the Spanish mission period. And so it's very interesting to me when uh, historical practice now becomes an anathema in kind of the modern, uh, what's socially acceptable. Um, because there's not, it's not necessarily good or bad. It's just the historical context is important. Um, and so I want to kind of raise the issue of then if he's a bad rancher, who quote unquote has been labeled as bad ranchers and what are the consequences of that? Uh, well, American Indians, so this is kind of, a, I'm using the term American Indians here because that's kind of the federal term for it that the USDA uses and I'm using their statistics. Um, so that's why I'm using that term. But American Indians uh, sued in a class action lawsuit of Keith Siegel versus Vilsack and were able to show that the USDA systematically discriminated against uh, this population uh, it, and basically denied them farm loans for several decades because um, they didn't consider them uh, good enough uh, for USDA farm loans. Um, and they won that lawsuit uh, quite in the past 10 years. Uh, but that's been an on, ongoing issue. Uh, there were forced stock reductions in the 1930s where the federal government forced uh, tribal herds to be uh, reduced or killed uh, because they didn't trust uh, Diné and, and Tahana Atam ranchers to uh, take care of their own lands. Um, in 2017, um, 75% of American Indian operated farms specialize in livestock production, including beef, sheep, and goat farming. So this is, so American Indians are engaging in ranching at higher levels than the rest of the US. And it's something that's ex a very important part of um, modern native culture. So there's, this is something that it's part, we have to, start rethinking and reframing these narratives. And so the way we talk about ranching history matters, who we center uh, as actors and who we kind of celebrate and who we talk about is important. And so when we talk about introduced livestock, we have a tendency to associate it with your Americans because these animals are from Eurasia. But the reality is, is that uh, these animals have been integrated into traditional indigenous landscapes and foodways. And so there has been a recent push in archeology span um, 
by the authors and myself in the past several years to really show that these animals are native. They have become part of native cultures and traditions of food waste. And so as we think about food culture, and I want to sort of kick off this, uh, this series of making you think a little bit more critically about what we think as traditional. Uh, and archaeologists have this unique ability to show the time depth and provide material evidence of these practices and really highlight sort of the everyday uh, work and labor that went into uh, ranching and sort of the lives of people at the missions um, and in other parts of the colonial borderlands. And we're uniquely positioned to help reframe the debate around ranching strategies because we have this time depth and material evidence. Uh, so I hope uh, I offered you a little bit of food for thought uh, as we kick off this, this series at the Archaeology Cafe. And I invite you to think critically and wonder deeply what is in your taco. Uh, thank you all very much, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Mathwich. We really appreciated that talk. Um, I invite everyone uh, to submit your questions to the Q&A uh, box, uh, and we can uh, have some questions for her here. So feel free to start entering those. Um, I do have one that's in there that kind of starts us off at the beginning with your talk, um, kind of framing the idea of um, you as a, a zooarchaeologist and, and how does you, this field, this kind of section of, of archaeology interact with the science of animal behavior and um, and kind of what training, if any, and what integration do you have with that um, with that other science? Yeah, uh, so thank you uh, for that question, Susan, of how does how do we interact with um, animal behavior and ethology? Uh, for the most part, we rely on uh, on that field to provide a lot of information about uh, animals uh, that we can use and that we can use in our models for thinking about uh, the past. So for my part, I'm often using USDA um, and farming examples for estimates for how much uh, an animal eats, such as a horse or a cow. Uh, versus a sheep and to kind of estimate how much area they would require and how much water they would need. So I'm using modern estimates, which are problematic in some ways because they're based on breeds that we know might require more water or are more economically valuable now than they were in the past. So uh, we don't have as much information about heritage breeds, but uh, we still can use them in our models. F specifically, they're quite valuable for uh, doing like computer modeling. Um, so that's been something. So we do use, and I draw on those uh, animal behavioral studies quite often, uh, but I don't do them myself because I'm I'm usually dealing with the dead ones, um, they, and they don't they don't move. <laughs> uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, another question here: Are um, there other uh, autumn mission sites that you have compared uh, with the site you mentioned in your talk uh, regarding livestock? Yes, hi Dan. Uh, <laughs> shout out. Um, um, yes, uh, so Mission Guavavi is just one of uh, many uh, sites that I've looked at. Uh, I've, in other sort of published works, I've uh, compared um, it to. I've done work on Mission Dolores, um, and Mission Tumacacari, and uh, San Javier del Bac. Uh, as well as uh, Tubac Presidio and Tucson Presidio. So I've been looking at these sites, I've sampled them for isotopic materials and uh, also done some zooarchaeological work on them as well. But that's, uh, that's uh, the, this other stuff there. <laughs> but it's, it's definitely part of one of my broader uh, research. This is a piece of kind of my broader work, both in um, Sonora and Arizona, as well as San Diego and Baja California. Thank you for that question. So much more to much more to learn and explore from these. Uh, it's a fun these place. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We could probably have a whole series about it. Uh, and so we have another uh, question um, from one of our very own staff members. Um, he's asking about jaguar predation. Um, 
is there archaeological or documentary ev evidence of uh, jaguars taking sheep or goats or cattle? Uh, so we don't, uh, we see them mentioned. Uh, so it's a good question, John, especially as, you know, jaguars are coming back into Arizona, which is incredibly exciting. Um, and also providing a headache for a lot of um, the miner, mining, mining companies in the area. Um, but uh, in we do have some uh, historical mentions of, of jaguars. We know them to historically be in the region, uh, but oftentimes, you know, people would just find the carcasses and not necessarily know if it was a mountain lion or, or a jaguar. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, they they do take cattle they do take they they do go for things that are kind of smaller so they they do like the sheep and the goats and they can jump into enclosures so there's sort of that kind of gets into this kind of behavioral issue of like how do you kind of monitor um these sorts of things but uh the criollo cattle they they're going to be able to defend themselves a little bit more they do have the large horns um and so they have a little bit more independence than the smaller ungulates. I have a good question. Yeah, very interesting, especially with their um, reemergence that we've been seeing. It's exciting. Um, yeah, definitely. I love seeing that um, in the news. Uh, we have another question that wants a little bit more elaboration on the Jesuit expulsion. And I know this is a big topic, so if we maybe could just direct them in a general way, and then we could always provide follow-up information too. Yeah, so the Jesuit expulsion is 1767. It's one of the big conspiracy theories, but basically uh, the Jesuit order was getting too powerful in New Spain, um, and it was, and they started getting kicked out of different areas of Europe. Uh, many of the monarchs uh, became very nervous, and so King Carlos of Spain uh, kicked them out all of and expelled them out of all of New Spain. Um, and uh, this was a big issue both in South America and North America. Uh, but there was a kind of a, a long term resentment um, towards the Jesuit missions um, because they basically sort of were able to have a monopoly on indigenous labor and a lot of other colonists wanted that indigenous labor. And just so you, and this is all sort of coerced labor, right? The They sort of forced indigenous peoples to um, participate in missions and agriculture and to kind of create these um, common own things. Uh, so people were resentful of it. And so they use a conspiracy theory uh, as an excuse to kind of kick the Jesuits out. So the Jesuits were uh, forcibly expelled. Uh, they were escorted in Sonora, they were escorted out. Uh, in 1767, and the missions were taken over by uh, the Franciscan missionaries. Um, and this took a, a, a bit of a, over a year or two to kind of fully take root. Things just happened slowly then. Uh, but yeah, it all was meant to happen on a particular day. It's a really interesting history, and it's part of the overall things that was happening globally in Spain uh, as part of the Bourbon reforms, um, as they sort of tried to uh, kind of centralize uh, and modernize parts of the Spanish empire. That's a very good, concise um, answer. Thank you. Uh, there's another uh, more specific question about uh, Criollo cattle being similar to Texas Longhorns. What are what are your, what's your take on that? Uh, so Texas Longhorns are sort of a, a so it's they they have some. My understanding, I'm not an expert on Texas Longhorns by any stretch of imagination, but they do have origins in this period, um, but they have uh, some other kind of, they've been bred to be, have very long horns, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but they do have some of that origin. And in in terms of like what was happening, a lot of the, the Longhorns are coming from Mission Cattle um, uh, in Texas and then kind of had their own sort of subbreed. But many of the cattle in Texas, once they sort of ate up all of the grass in Texas, they heard that there was grass in Arizona. And so in the like 1880s and 90s, they were many thousands of cattle were driven into Arizona and then also triggered um, a massive like deep vegetation of the region. Um, but so they're related, they're definitely related, uh, but they're not quite the same. Um, they're kind of considered separate uh, in the US cattle sort of breed rankings. Thank you. Um, 
We have a former uh, former cafe speaker from last year asking um, if you can speak a little bit more to how and where you gathered uh, the compre uh, comparative landscape scale isotopic data to interpret your cattle and uh, Sorry, I can't pronounce that. <laughs> Ovicaprid, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Ovicaprid, teeth values. Yeah. To... yeah, thanks for your question, Wade. Um, <laughs> shout out. Uh, uh, it was, uh, I had to to get the comparative information. Um, I used, uh, I had to go sample stock ponds as well as different water sources and uh, modern river sources. So modern water sources uh, to kind of get at when, what types of water uh, the animals were drinking. Um, but the C4 and C3 plants were sort of kind of what is known about uh, the grasses in the area. However, there needs to be a lot more work done um, on where cam plants, particularly the, the cacti, are falling on that C4, C3 spectrum because they are sort of fixing most of the time on the C4. And so they might be muddying the signal a little bit. So there are, definitely is some issue of whether, you know, these animals are eating um, uh, cacti as well. But when I've looked at uh, sort of modern farming studies of what cattle are eating, they are tending to eat grasses. Um, so in Arizona, so when we look at kind of the experimental ranges in Arizona, the cattle, when they have a choice, they will prefer grass over, say, cacti. They will eat it if they have to, but for the most part, they prefer grass if they have a chance. So fixing towards the C4 end of the spectrum. Great. Um, and we have another question about uh, these uh, heritage breeds of cattle. Are they still being raised, the, the descendants of the Criollo cattle? Yeah, the Criollos are uh, are still being raised. Uh, they are not particularly valued because they are tend to be quite lean, smaller, and uh, sort of rangier. So they're not. They are a couple heritage ranches have them around, uh, but they're not as economically viable as the Angus and sort of uh, British breeds, and as well as kind of African British uh, hybrids that have begun emerging um, in the past uh, several decades. So that's something that they're around, but they're not, um, they're, they're not in large numbers anymore. Um, a similar sort of kind of, they tend to be sort of local species. So in on the East Coast, there's uh, kind of a similar cow called the cracker, cracker cattle, and they're also descended from Spanish uh, colonial animals. Um, there are people who are doing genetic work on uh, these heritage breeds to kind of see how the genes have sort of moved on, but it uh, it's still sort of forthcoming. So we'll hopefully know in, in the next few years kind of how they compare to archeological specimens and how the genetics work. Is that something that you're involved in, that kind of work, or? No, I'm not involved yeah. in genetics, so, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, it's, uh, the preservation is really tough on the on the stuff in the Pimari Alta. You saw how smashed up that bone is. Yeah. So it would be, it would be, a, it would be an interesting challenge, yeah. Yeah, so that then leads into this question from our president, uh, Bill Doley is asking, um, what are your next research interests and questions um, for this research? and he says you did an amazing job. Uh, currently, I'm working on uh, building a project uh, both in Baja, California and in San Diego. Um, I'm continuing to kind of do more comparative uh, regional analyses uh, in the Pima Rialta and Sonora, but I've sort of shifted to Baja, California and looking at uh, sort of Swedish Americans uh, entering uh, into ranching in Baja, California during the Porfiriato. So a lot of immigrants were sort of pulled in uh, by promises of land and they ended up in in very arid regions of Baja California with very little water and so uh, it it's a really interesting ranching story. Um, I'm also looking at uh, shell middens in that area too because uh, partially out of kind of preservation of the region because uh, the coastal areas are just constantly under threat um, throughout Baja California for development. Uh, so that's something that we were looking at is kind of the density of sites uh, on the coast uh, with shell middens and uh, agave processing. 
um, and we'll also be doing that. So I've got a lot of a lot of pots in the fire, but I'm very interested in how people are sort of adapting to arid landscapes, whether pre-contact or uh, even into the 19th century. Very interesting. Uh, thank you. Um, another question about the cattle and where they were, you know, where they arrived at, uh, and did they come kind of from deeper in Mexico, or did they come closer to um, where the missions are? Did they were they brought over on a uh, more close closely to um, the missions that that you've been researching? Um, so originally they are coming, you know, from from Spain and kind of entering central Mexico that way. But by the time period that we get at, it's already been, you know, over a century since uh, it's been a century since kind of the the first uh, sort of Spaniards in, in Mesoamerica and the the Spanish were slowly kind of moving north and then they kind of stopped when they hit the Gran Chichimeca and had to kind of adapt to a new kind of style of expansion and the agrarian sort of wave was was kind of part of that. Um, so the the cattle that I'm looking at right here are actually from um, uh, the previous sort of round and previous uh, sort of rectorate uh, that had been established by the Jesuits further south than Sonora. So what we're looking at in the Pima Alta is sort of the northernmost portion of Sonora and there had been uh, ranches and uh, missions already established and it's from those that Father Kino was uh, drawing on for seed herds. So the animals, I guess, were sort of already in the region at the time, so they weren't coming from other areas. So in many ways, they're already in desert adapted by the time they were entering uh, Northern Sonora and Southern Arizona. Makes a lot of sense. Well, we've made it, uh, we made it through all of our questions that we have so far, but if, if anyone has further questions, feel free to email email us here at Archaeology Southwest and we can kind of get them, uh, we can try to get them answered. And um, we appreciate everyone's attendance tonight. And, and thank you so much, um, Dr. Mathwick. We've learned so much and this has been such an interesting, interesting, great way to start the season. Um, I want to remind everyone before everyone leaves that we do have another talk on Tuesday, November, um, yeah, November 7th, uh, 2023 at six o'clock Arizona time um, by Dr. Elizabeth Lauterbach um, entitled Ancient Domestication of the Four Corners Potato, Archaeology, Sex, and Genetics. So we look forward to seeing you all there and we thank you for being here tonight. And, and thanks again, um, doc, Dr. Mathwick. We've really appreciated it. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you so much.